How's it going everybody? Joe Snow here with another deck tech video. Um, so I wanted to do a deck tech today on the particular version of Dagon that uh, I just used to get Grandmaster. Um, I basically used this deck to climb from high 4300s to breaking the 4500 mark, hit the rank 21, and get the Grandmaster title. Now, it really shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that Dagon is a powerful deck and, you know, it's sort of dominating the, uh, the top tiers of the ladder right now. But this deck does have enough interesting and unique things going on, um, and I got a lot of questions about it yesterday. So I did want to do a video explaining some of the choices and uh, why I would recommend this deck for current ranked play. First, let's get into some of the statistics here. Uh, normally, when I do a deck tech for you guys, I have... Uh, between 50 and 100 game sample size with a particular deck. This one you'll notice is much smaller. This is only an 18 game sample size as um, I basically built the deck yesterday. But as you can see, we went 14 and 4 with it, uh, which is a pretty solid record. Now, sure, you can say small sample size, a little bit of high rolling, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but push comes to shove, 14 and 4 is showing that the deck certainly has some promise. And I'm going to be continuing my climb with this deck personally towards reaching number one. Um, in particular, of note, you can see the 7 and 1 in the Monster Mirror. And more than just the, th the statistics, I felt highly favored in all of the Monster Mirrors. So let's get talking about um, the cards in the deck. This is a Dagon deck, so we're playing Foglets. Um, and we have Harpies because we're a monster deck. No big surprise there. One of the first decisions I made was that I wanted to be playing the Frost Dogs in this version. And I think it's too greedy right now to be playing Frost Dogs with Crones. So that's why we do not see the crones here. I think the frost dogs are powerful enough, uh, particularly at popping harpy eggs in the mirror, overwhelming your opponent's clear weather effects, and in particular, it's amazing against the, the new Skellige discard deck, or relatively new, that's been running around. We're currently 4-0 versus that list. Um, the frost is just super powerful. It's much better against the ships because it can be combined with lacerates and whatnot to actually take them down. And I just think Frost Dogs are sort of where you want to be um, in the meta right now. One of the other meta calls in the bronze slot here, pretty much almost rounding it out, is the double Arch Griffin. There is a lot of Dagon on the ladder. Um, in round one, if you can get them to pop their hero power and then trade a Griffin for their hero power, basically you're trading a bronze for their hero power at only minus one efficiency. That is hugely favored for you not to mention the additional um benefits you get let's say they're running one of the necker warrior tris but sw super swarmy type of lists then you can potentially shut down their necker warriors things like that uh the griffins have proved invaluable two may look like overkill currently i'm very very happy with it uh i'm not a super big fan of just running one and trying to high roll and have it although two can be clunky um, particularly if you have them both in your opener, you usually don't mulligan them away. Um, many of the Dagon lists are not even running Bronze Fog, like this one. So you're basically able to shut down their Hero Power and then shut down their Woodland Spirit in round three. And the ability to do both of that, basically locking them out of Fog, is very, very powerful. Uh, the last two Bronze cards we have here are two Thunderbolt Potions. You could make a case for the immune boost potions i greatly prefer thunderbolt um in any matchup where weather is not a thing uh well not any matchup uh there are some damaging effects let's say double thumb trappers lacerate things like that where the immune boost uh can come in handy the simple ability to just throw down 12 points from a bronze card i think is too powerful to overlook i wouldn't call anyone crazy for playing immune boost but i do prefer the thunderbolt by a pretty significant margin and that's where i want to stay for now also, the one of Lacerate. Lacerate is just an insane card right now. Um, it's hard to find a matchup where you're not getting good, solid value out of it. Sometimes it's just an absolute blowout. And in this deck in particular, we have so many movement effects um, to make our Lacerate much better than normal. Lacerate's fine in your average deck. And if you have cards that are able to move things around, such as Caranthir and Jotun, which is uh, sort of the heart and soul of this deck, um, the last rate just gets even more super powered. It's absolutely insane, and I, um, I'm really happy sitting at one. You, you really don't want a ton of them to be clogging up your hand when you need some proactive threats. Uh, but yeah, the last rate is powerful, and I wouldn't consider changing it at the moment. So we're going to move into our silver slots. As we talked about earlier, uh, there's no crones, and that's largely due to 
two factors. A, the fact that I think the Frost Dogs are too important not to run in Dagon right now. And the Crones get super greedy and can really mess with your mulligans. Um, the other reason... Wow, I just sort of blanked on my train of thought. Yeah, the other reason we're not running Crones is because I wanted to include powerful effects for the odd Dwarf deck and things like that. You see, such as Becker's Twisted Mirror. Becker's also is very, very good against the Skellige deck that's going to drop a gigantic pirate against you at one point or another. Um, and we are usually able to get the mirror off, um, being that we have Harpies for ones, we have twos, we have Fire Ellie for ones, we have Woodland Spirit for ones. We have a lot of ways to get small dudes into play, and a most of the time you're able to get great value off the mirror. Once in a while, particularly in the Monster Mirror, um, you'd think the mirror would be good in the mirror, but it's actually not that great there. If you have it stuck in your hand, you're sort of looking to get rid of it as quick as possible. Um, just to, you know, assure some value out of it, and I oftentimes find myself mulliganing it away in the Monster Mirror, just because sometimes it can be awkward or even dead. Uh, that being the case, we're still very good in the Monster Mirror, because the rest of our deck is teched so heavily against it. We have the Double Griffin, we have extra weather effects, and our gold package happens to be really, really powerful there. So I think the Mirror justifies its spot in solidifying some of the other matchups, and it doesn't weaken your monster matchup enough for it to really matter. Uh, the Spy here uh, sort of kind of goes without saying. You need to counter your opponent's Spy. The Monster Spy is arguably the most powerful as a 10 with more movement. Granted, the, the selection is terrible. It's actually non-existent. You just get the top card of your deck for the most part. Um... But it's still super powerful, being the fact that you have weather to chip it down. It also combos with Beckers. Um, the Spy is just as close to an auto-include as you could possibly get these days. When we get to the rest of the Silvers, the Water Hag. Uh, it's basically, it's usually our second Lacerate, although there are plenty of times where it's acceptable to go with the Rain. Uh, some Northern Realms matchups come into uh, question there. Uh, particularly the new row stacking one where, you know, they're trying to get out of vests and do trios, things like that. Uh, the rain can come in handy there. Rain's another great way to pop harpy eggs. When you're playing against consume, rain can be an absolute beating. It's very, very powerful there. Uh, so sorry about that, guys. So there is a lot going on with the hag. It's flexible. It's versatile. It's great. Um, I wouldn't recommend cutting it at all. Fire Elemental is kind of in here just on base strength. Um, it's a 13 strength unit upwards of 90% of the time, right? You're generally going to have some sort of target. Then it also has utility of popping harpy eggs. Are you guys noticing a pattern here? Harpy eggs are a huge deal. You need to come prepared with many, many ways to deal with them. You want to constantly be able to deal with the stupid eggs. Um, so that does that. It also lines up three guys perfectly for our Thunderbolt potion, which is very nice. Provides a bunch of little dudes for our mirror. Um, it just has a lot of powerful synergies with the deck, as well as just being a strong standalone card. Uh, just getting 13 solid value is often enough a lot of times. Enabling your Thunderbolts, killing Harpy Eggs, these are all, um, you know, obvious advantages to it. But we wouldn't be playing it if it was an understated minion just for the synergies. It's just really nice stats that also happens to have synergy with the deck. It makes things work. Um, it's great. So, Fiend, Fiend is sort of controversial at the moment. It's very okay. Uh, this is definitely the worst silver in the deck right now. Um, when you're running into Consume and Dwarves and things like that, it certainly has a lot of utility. It's, like, okay against Reaver Hunters, although that's not usually the axis you want to try and fight Reaver Hunters on with this style of deck anyway. But once in a while, it can come in handy. Um, you know, it's just a fine, solid card. And it's mostly in here for a lot of the same reason that we tried out Jotun, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, although the Jotun has performed much better than the Fiend. And that's that I don't think Commander's Horn is proper in this deck list. If you notice, we're not running any of the, uh, the Earth Elementals. Because I did want to make room for the Frost Dogs, which we obviously have to play the Frosts. And I'm very happy with the two Arch Griffins here. So that being the case, and me being a little down on Earth Elementals in general... Um, means that I didn't have the space for them. Without the space for them, it's pretty difficult to um, to consistently get value off of Commander's Horn. Commander's Horn is fine if you're hitting four units, it's like good. And if you're hitting five units, it's fantastic, obviously, right? Um, but oftentimes that's not going to be the case. So I didn't think Commander's Horn was a perfect fit for this deck. So Fiend kind of squeaked his way in here. 
Then we get to Jotun. Um, half of the reason why I'm calling this deck Gagon Giants. Jotun has... The first couple of games I played, I was considering cutting him. He was just sort of something wacky. I would try out, see how I liked it. He's been absolutely insane for me. Once again, we are looking at a small sample size here. And it's entirely possible um, that, you know, situations happen to work out. But the fact of him comboing with not only Lacerate, but just being able to turn on and off Spear Tip two to three times in a round in combination with Caranthir. If you can get to a long round three, this card's absolutely insane. He also has some other just base utility in there against Consume, for example. Uh, if you don't have a rain effect and you don't want to burn your last rate because they're quite valuable there at clearing out a whole row of Arrakis's or um, finishing off the Grave Hag, the Jotun can pop a Harpy, you know, he almost takes out the entire Harpy, dealing with the eggs, which you generally don't want to do, um, let's say, in a Dagon Mirror or against Eridan, but happens to be really, really good when you're playing against Consume. So the Jotun has been overperforming for me, and he's just sort of been an all-star. Him in combination with, let's get to our goals, Old Spear Tip, another guy that's just been wildly, wildly overperforming for me. In the Monster Mirror, which there's obviously a lot of, this guy is just a monster winning round one. Oftentimes, you're going to slam him down in round one, and your opponent's going to be forced to pass. Uh, he just creates so many terrible situations for your opponent, as he's very easy to get 18 to 20 points of value out of. And oftentimes, in this deck, with the Jotun, the Frightener, the Caranthir, you're looking at upwards of 30 points out of a gold card, which is just insane value, right? Not to mention that he has added utility in, let's say you're playing against a Bork or a Scorch, you can sort of stagger your guys, play around Igni. Um, there are obviously small minor uses for his um, come-to-play buff ability, but the guy's been an absolute powerhouse for me, so these two giants put together have really, really just been crushing it and uh, performing well above where I thought they would be performing. The rest of the golds is fairly standard. I mean, Woodland Spirit, we're a Dagon deck. We're playing Woodland Spirit. The card's insane. Uh, probably a bit too good. Not a whole lot to say there. The Caranthir, um, A, great on his own. Just very solid. Uh, he's even better in this deck than normal, once again, because we do have the Spear Tip and the Jotun. They all synergize with each other. Um, the movement ability is great. Plus, we have access to a maximum of two Lacerates. Uh, actually, maximum of three if we caretaker our opponent's grave hag, which happens uh, a fair amount of the time. So the movement is very, very important in this deck. So the Caranthir is an all-star, uh, not to mention he has a lot of utility against the Skellige deck. Um, if you win the coin toss, obviously you're in a reasonable spot already, you won the coin toss. But when they slam down a boat, you can just Caranthir the back row and then just watch them kind of wriggle around with nothing to do. As now their boat has no target, they really don't want to play a second boat into it because then they get lacerated. Are they supposed to start using their Bran with no target on board? You can put your opponent in a very, very awkward situation. Um, oftentimes, you don't want to use it that way, but certain hands have led me to play it that way in the Skellige matchup, and it's been performing well. And we have our Caretaker. He's sort of just another utility slot. Uh, and that's something this deck has a lot of, right? Utility. It's got a lot of movement. It's got a lot of weird buffs. It's got ways to deal with weathers. Uh, it's sort of a jack-of-all-trades type of Dagon deck. Uh, not super dissimilar from a lot of the other versions out there, but this one does have its own um, uniqueness to it. And I think Caretaker is just solid enough. Once again, he's great against the Skellige decks running around. Uh, in the Monster's Mirror, being able to steal their Grave Hag, I mean, uh, their Water Hag, or their Fire Elemental is amazing, particularly Fire Elemental, although it's usually more powerful to steal their Water Hag. The Fire Elemental is much more common, uh, particularly when you lose the Coin Toss, because if you go first, a lot of times with this deck you're leading on Harpy, right? We don't have an Earth Elemental, we don't want to lead on Griffin, um, and I mean, you can lead on Wild Hunt Hound, but like 9 times out of 10, you're going to be leading on Harpy. Um, and when you lead on Harpy, a lot of times people are just going to try and deal with those eggs, lead on early Fire Elemental. So you'll be having access to that um, latest round two most of the times, and a lot of the times you'll be able to weather that thing down and play it later in round one if necessary. So the Caretaker has given me just enough value um, to be really good. The notable place where he's bad is Northern Realms. Against Northern Realms, the card definitely does not pull his weight, and there's only one real target in the entire deck you're looking to hit. Once in a while you get a Marguerite, but it's really about Death Mold. Um, a lot of the times, if you can pull out their Death Mold early, which, you know, they're not going to mulligan it, 
and you have so many weather effects they're likely to use at round one pulling out their death mold to like snipe a reaver hunter or something like that usually the first one's on seven uh it comes up more often you would think and just being able to go caretaker into death mold into thunder your reaver is a fairly powerful play that being said it's definitely at its 100 percent worst in that matchup um also if you run into any of the wonky skoy decks or anything crazy like that running around um i mean stealing extra reveal is you know amazing it's really really good in this deck considering we do have like a minor swarm type of theme going on uh the caretaker is just overall solid against skellige you can steal their skirmisher um a lot of the higher level skellige players aren't even relying on the skirmisher um, so you don't even need the Caretaker, like, they're sort of playing around it, so I guess you're losing a bit of value by actually playing it, uh, but sometimes they're just forced into playing it, and a lot of times you're a pretty large favorite there, so you can sort of control the tempo of the game, and if they have it, they're gonna have to play it out at one point or another, and you'll be able to jack it. So, this is the current deck that I've been messing around with, um, like I said, small sample size, 14 and 4, um, I don't know, it's been crushing for me, I'm gonna continue to play this deck on the ladder in my stream later today. Uh, I did get a lot of questions about it, why specific choices and stuff, so I wanted to do a video on it. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you liked it, uh, please go click subscribe. Cost you nothing. Helps me out a lot. And uh, yeah, enjoy the deck. Good luck with it. I will catch you guys later. Joe Snow, signing off. Have a good one, guys.